There's a bed on the platform. How many of you have been sitting here tonight wondering what's under the bed? Raise your hands. What's under this bed tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is what I'm going to preach about. You've probably been watching to see if it's moving. How many of you have been watching to see if it's moving? Sure you have. How many of you have noticed that nothing has breathed under this bed? But there are some of you here and many of you watching that you are going to bed every night with what's under these sheets. Got that jib ready, brother? Got the jib ready over there? You ready for this picture? How many want to see what's under the bed? Under the sheets. Here's what a lot of you are going to bed with. A goat. <laughs> An old, wrinkled, there's other things I could say, but I won't. Goat. I've got your attention. If I've never had your attention, I'm telling you I've got your attention tonight here at Hickson, Tennessee. What is this about? I want to share something with you that has to do with the temples in Jerusalem that used to exist, both Herod's temple and what was known in the Old Testament as Solomon's temple. Here's the statement. The adversary, the enemy, or Satan has always attempted to gain access into the three temples. First, I want you to look at the temple at Jerusalem. There was a temple that existed in the time of King Solomon. There was a temple that existed in the time of King Herod. Solomon's temple was destroyed. Herod's temple was actually a rebuilding of Solomon's uh, after the ruins of the destruction in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. It was expanded upon in the time of King Herod, which was 16 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. There are three chambers in that temple, as you well know, what is known as the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. The outer court is where the common people were. The, what we call the inner court is where the Levites were permitted to go. The Holy of Holies, only one man once a year was permitted to walk, and that was the high priest. What is interesting is this, and don't miss this point, Satan was given limited access to that temple. And I can prove it in a scripture in Zechariah chapter 3. As they are rebuilding the temple after the Babylonian captivity, guess, ladies and gentlemen, who is there standing on the right side of the altar trying to resist the building of the temple? Read it in your Bible. Satan resisting the rebuilding of the temple. When you begin to look at this, Satan had access to the outer court. There were times when a king went in and he did something he should not do, offered incense on the golden altar in the inner court, and he was struck with leprosy, but you cannot find, and don't you miss this, where Satan was ever given permission to enter into the Holy of Holies, nor was there any time on record that he ever resisted anything that actually went on inside the actual Holy of Holies. Thus, he was limited to two areas, the outer court, the inner court, but did not have access to what we would call the Holy of Holies. Now, why is that important to understand? Here's the reason why it's important to understand. Because the Bible says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, when you understand that the Bible says that you are a body, soul, and spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, then you will understand how the body is a picture of the outer court, the soul is a picture of the inner court, and the human spirit is a picture of the Holy of Holies. Why is it important to understand that? For this reason, Satan was only given access to two out of the three areas in the time of the Old Covenant. What does that have to do with me and you? Listen, according to Luke 13, a woman who was a daughter of Abraham that had the Abrahamic covenant was sick with the spirit of infirmity. The outer court represents the body. It's the part I look at. It's the part I see. It's the part I touch. Yeah, I, can, I can walk up to you, pat you on the back, and give you a hug because that's the outer court. It's where all the natural light is. But there's another level. That's the inner court. The inner court is not the body. The inner court's the soul, the mind, the intellect, your ability to think. Yes, Satan made a woman who had a covenant sick, meaning he had access to the body. But then we read in the Word of God, if you, in uh, Matthew 16, 23, where Jesus says to Simon Peter, get behind me, Satan. What had Peter done? He had spoke something out of his mouth. Where had the words originated? Inside of his head. What does the inside of the head or the mind represent? It's the inner court. You've got the outer 
outer court, you've got the inner court. The inner court of the temple has the menorah. The inner court has the golden altar. The inner court has the table of shoe bread. When you learn, you have to eat the bread. You have to eat the Word of God. That's learning with your mind. The seven candlesticks represents the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You have to reason. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. When you offer your prayers, you form your words with your mind. Where does the devil attack you? In your thought life. He attacks you in your brain. He attacks you in your mind. So in other words, when you look at the parallel of the temple in Jerusalem and you understand Satan standing out there to resist out here, he had access in this area here through a person to attack a person but was limited in the spirit. You better hear what I'm about to tell you right now. I've heard people preach for years that Christians can have demons. Now let me say this. Christians can be depressed by a spirit. Christians can be oppressed by a spirit. Christians can have the fiery darts of the enemy come against their mind. But the devil is, has a limitation tied on him. He may attack the physical body, which is the outer court. He may attack the mind, which is the soul of the inner court. But brother, the Holy Spirit in my spirit is not going to let a devil get in there, come on and live in the same place where he's living. Because my spirit man has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The blood is in there. And so there is a, look at your neighbor and say, there's an off-limits place where the enemy can't touch. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, you have the temple in which we see the enemy, the temple in Jerusalem, which we see the enemy trying to move into. Then you have the temple, which is your body, our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. But then there's a third temple, believe this or not. Everybody ready for this? Here's a Jewish teaching. After 70 AD, the home was the center of spiritual life. It was considered a small temple or a small sanctuary. The home became more important than the, than the actual sanctuary. The spiritual life of a Jew was taught in the home continually. Continually. You went to the synagogue on Shabbat once a week, but continually in your down sitting and in your uprising, in your going out and your coming in, you taught the Word, you taught the things of God, you taught the things of the of Lahaim or life of the Spirit or the bread. Now, in every home that you live in, of every believer that is here, there are three main living spaces, and uh, you probably know what they are. First is the kitchen, the second is the living room, and the third is the bedroom. Now, you sleep an average, the average person sleeps about six seven hours a night, that's average. So that tells you how much time you spend in the bedroom. The average American watches television seven to eight hours a day. That tells you how much time you spend in the living room. But then there's also a kitchen area, and I have no idea how long you spend in the kitchen. But watch this carefully. Watch this outer court, inner court, and holy of holies. Watch how it works in your home, in the kitchen, the living room, and the bedroom. The kitchen is for the body, the living room is for the soul, and the bedroom is for the spirit. Oh, now how do you figure that? Here's how you figure it out. Because in the kitchen is where you feed your body. Your body's hungry. Your belly's cramping. You, you, you're wanting food. So that's the outer court is your kitchen because that's where you're feeding your body and you're taking care. By the way, in the outer court is where the meat was offered. In the outer court is where the meat was burned. In the outer court is where they cooked the sacrifices. Does anybody hear this? So don't think it's that crazy when I tell you this. Number two, the living room is for the soul. What do I mean by the soul? The intellect. That's where you watch TV. That's where you go on the internet. That's where you carry on your conversations. You go into the living room. Let's go in the living room. Let's talk. Let's have fellowship a little bit. But the bedroom is the holy of holies. Come on, talk to me, because there's things that go on in the Holy of Holies you don't tell people about. Watch out now, I think I'll preach. And the two shall be one flesh. And I don't want to get into all that and, and go into the, the depth of that, but I want, to, I want to share with you that perspective from the Bible. The Bible said Adam knew his wife Eve. That does not mean he knew her when he saw her and said, look, there's my wife Eve. There's a Hebrew word know that means an intimate relationship with. He had an intimate relationship with her. In the bedroom, representative of the Holy of Holies, where you shut the doors. Y'all get this in a minute. There was a veil up that only certain people came in. Once you shut the doors, there's only certain people allowed in the Holy of Holies. Some of you married couples, I can tell you, act like you ain't been in the Holy of Holies in a while. <laughs> Maybe I will turn this into a marriage seminar before it's over with. <laughs> but here's the key. 
The Holy of Holies was the intimate place. The Holy of Holies is where the presence of God was. So the bedroom of the house is much more intimate than the living room and definitely much more intimate than the kitchen. It's the private place. Now here's what I'm going to tell you today. The enemy is trying to get into the holy place. Go back and think about the three places we just talked about. What do I mean by that? The enemy, if you look at the, te the holy of holies, well, he would love to get in there to defile the presence of God, and I'm talking about the Jewish temple. When it comes to the body, he would love to be able to get into your spirit and corrupt your spirit and possess you and control you over top of the Holy Spirit, and he would love to get into your bedroom life, if I can say this, married couples, and disrupt the intimate relationship that you have with your companion. Now, how do you keep the enemy out of the temple? In the Old Testament time, listen carefully, in the temple, the time of the temple, they kept, they, let's, let's go back over this. In the time of the temple in Jerusalem, both Solomon and Herod's temple, they had three things going on, and the Bible will reveal this to you in the Old Testament. Number one, there were watchmen. Number two, there were uh, uh, night watches. And number three, there were gatekeepers. And all three of these were assigned the same thing, to keep an enemy that should not be coming in from getting inside the gate of the city and destroying the city. Watchmen were men that stood on the wall looking for invading armies. Night watches were priests that were assigned the duties of the night watches of the temple. Let me tell you how serious this was. Edersheim, the Jewish author, said that if a priest was caught sleeping in the night watch, the, the high priest would come out and strip him of his clothes in front of all the other priests and burn his clothes while he stood there naked and ashamed for sleeping while he should have been staying awake. And the hardest watch according to history was the fourth watch which was three to six in the morning when your body normally wants to be sleeping. Now this is why Jesus said, watch and pray and be aware of my coming lest when I come I find you naked. In other words, don't be sleeping, stay awake at my return. That's why he keeps saying in the Bible, watch as well us pray. Then there were people that guarded the gates. The gates had to be locked at night, opened in the morning, but locked again at night. Once again, you had gatekeepers, you had night watches, and you had actual watchmen on the wall to guard the temple in Jerusalem. Now, how do you guard the physical body? By eating properly, watching the food that comes into your body, being careful, by exercising. It's a fact. You will live longer if you exercise. You, we protect ourselves. You got stun guns, guns, self-defense, maze, bodyguards, whatever you want to have. But we, we really we are always trying to make sure that we take care of our body. Now, let me tell you something. I can go back to the temple and tell you, a lot of people don't know this, but they, they changed those veils every two years. They had a place called the Chamber of the Virgins in the temple in which they sewed together 72 squares, a hand's breadth big, and they replaced You know why they had to replace them? They sprinkled so much blood on the veil that it started sagging, and it got sagging in the middle, and they had to replace them about every two years. Now, now, the reason I'm sharing that with you, they, when they wanted to have a priest who would repair the temple, they would have a Levite. Not a, this is a high priest outfit, but they would have a Levite in those four linen garments, put him in a box, and that box, you, you, you could not look behind him. He was in an actual box, but that box was lowered on a wall, and he would check every brick there. He would check everything in that temple because where he was facing the wall was open, and they had to repair the temple. They had to white, uh, put whitewash the altar. They had to clean the blood off of the steps. Let me tell you, just like the temple had to have repair in Jerusalem, you got to have repair sometimes in your physical body. Sometimes it's surgery in the natural. Sometimes it's, uh, it's come on, it's losing weight. Sometimes it's watching what you eat, but everybody needs a repair every now and then. Look at your neighbor and say, I think he's preaching about you. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. The third thing, and we're going somewhere with this, is guarding your, your, the, guarding your spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, so you've got to guard your spirit because we've talked about the greatest danger is what is in your head dropping down into your spirit. Let me say it again. The greatest danger is what is in your head dropping down in your spirit. I want to say something to, to those of you, especially new converts. When I grew up in early Pentecost, they were very strict in everything, and I'm telling you, if you even thought 
you thought something wrong. You thought you were backslid. You thought you'd lost out with God. You thought your name had been erased in the book of life. Dear Lord, if that's the case, I wore out erasers when I was a kid. But you see the thing, oh my, preach on Brother Perry. I think I'm going to go ahead and preach this here if you don't mind. And, and what begins to happen is this, that, that we, we were taught growing up to live right, but we were also taught condemnation. It's like the more we could preach condemnation and the more we could make people feel bad, then maybe they would live a little bit better. Come on, don't look at me like that. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, here's the problem with that. Everybody ready? We could have a sister over here that had her sleeves down to here, her dress down to there, didn't have an ounce of makeup on and no jewelry, but she'd have a tongue so big you could wrap it around a telephone pole outside. <laughs> And then we, and then we, <laughs> and then you would have people, and they're always preaching on stuff. Here comes a poor guy at the altar, and they'd say to him, "You got to stop that drinking. You got to stop that cussing. You got to stop that drug abuse. You got to, you got to stop that smoking, because your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost." That's absolutely correct. But then, watch what I'm going to say. Then there would be things that they would say and have attitudes, and there's more said in the Bible about your words. Then there is some of the other things that became major in the church. I'm about to go there in a minute. So you might as well nod your little old heads yes and say he's about to go there in a minute. He's about to go there in a minute. Now, having said that, let me just say something to you. I'm glad the way I come up, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But what happened was in the early days of the full gospel movement, they emphasized the outward so much they paid no attention to the inward. They assumed that if you looked good outwardly, you were okay inwardly. And that is a Pharisee spirit because the Pharisees looked good outwardly but were full of dead men's bones inwardly. I'm going to go ahead and preach this anyway. Matthew chapter 15 says this, those things that proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defy the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. Now, we have been guilty, and I guess we can all say this if we've been in church any length of time, we have always been guilty of wanting to judge a person by what we see outwardly. If they're doing something that's a habit, man, that's bad. We need to pray for them. If they're doing something or dressed a certain way, man, you better tell that girl she better get some clothes on. You better, and so we, we're, we, we're, we are very, very guilty of only looking outwardly when the real problem many times is what was going on inside the spirit. Because although the devil himself could not get in that spirit, the spirit man became corrupted by... Y'all act like I don't know what I'm talking about. Let's talk about the internal junk. Number one is hate. The word for hate means malicious feelings toward another. First John 4 and 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Look at envy. The word envy means displeasure at the success of another. You're envious because somebody else is getting blessed. Listen, preachers fight that all the time. When the church across town starts doubling and tripling in attendance, then they get envious about it. They don't have nothing good to say about the guy. It's always, well, they're growing because of this. They're growing because of that. Listen to what the Bible says. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every work. James 3, 14 and 15. Then the Bible talks about fear. Fear is, by definition, dread or terror that causes you to fight or to run. 1 John 4 and 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment he that fears is not made perfect in love. There's another inward problem. You don't necessarily see it. Sometimes you do. And it's called anger. You can be angry and keep your mouth shut and walk away fuming. Or you can be angry and open your mouth and say things that you shouldn't say. But the definition of anger is an outburst caused by agitation or negative emotions. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sin go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Another one is called called evil communication slash lust, which is evil intercourse. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 34, be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness. Do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says that 
that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Let no corrupt word. Now, by the way, the word corrupt in Greek is to pine away, to wither away, to cause to be rotten, to cause to be worthless. Worth, listen, these are the words that kill. They don't bring life, they kill. It's an attitude problem. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good <laughs> for, for uh, edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you and all malice. Now, hate, envy, fear, anger, evil communications. These are things that actually corrupt. The Bible tells you they will corrupt not just your soul. They corrupt your spirit. And yet we spent many years, if a person looked the part, if they looked the way we thought they should look, if they had the hair fixed right, if they looked outwardly right, we would always assume they must be a very, very godly Christian. And my father pastored some of those so-called godly Christians, and there were one or two of them that were as mean as the Taliban. <laughs> Woo, I'm going to go ahead and preach it. So here's what happens. What happens is there's some of you that's going to bed every night with the old goat. Son, this is a real one right here. He got the parts. I'm going to put him right here where you can get a good look at him. He stands up. Some of you are going to bed with a goat. I want him to look at you. Turn around here, Billy. Turn around there, Billy. Someone told me it's a she. Okay. <laughs> Millie. <laughs> Millie the she-goat. <laughs> Listen carefully. In the Bible, animals represent things. Animals represent the characteristics of people many times, or they represent a person in the spirit. I'm going to yell an animal or a creature's name out to you, a creature, animal, slash, a beast, whatever. You yell back at me what you think it represents instantly. Are you ready? Here we go. A serpent. Come on, you say, gotta say it out, say it out loud. A serpent, a lamb, a wolf. Ah, uh, think about it. A wolf is a hypocrite. A sheep in wolf's clothing. Someone that's a hypocrite. A dove, the Holy Spirit. Sheep. Say it. Us. <laughs> you better hope it's a us. <laughs> a goat. A goat. Wait a minute. A goat and sheep are sometimes in the same field. Read it in your Bible. A goat. A sheep is a person. I mean, a, a, a sheep is a believer. A goat is someone that hangs with sheep, but they have deception in them. You know what you do with the goat? You got them in churches. The Bible said you've got wheat and tares. What do you do when you have a goat in the church? And you can always tell a goat from sheep. There's a key. I'm going to tell you how to tell the goat from a sheep. Sheep, do you love your pastor? Yeah. Yeah. You love Brother Stone? Yeah. You love the meeting? Yeah. Here's a goat. What would you think about the service? It was good, but... I like the music, but it was too loud. I like the preaching, but it was too long. I like the church, but I had a hard time getting to... You can always tell a goat by its butt. And I'm not saying that in the carnal sense. I'm saying... Christians say, well, it's good, but, but this, but this, but this, but this. Some of you, your butt's too big. I can see somebody watching television. I can't believe he said that. Get your, get your mind out of the gutter and hear how I'm saying it. But when you have sheep, sheep provide wool. I said to somebody, what are you when you got a bunch of old goats, just a bunch of folks in the church causing trouble? They said, you milk them for everything you can get. <laughs> That's what you do with the goat. Leave them in the church and just milk them. Now, if you think this has gotten crazy, it's about to really get crazy here, all right? I want you to pay careful attention for a moment 
to the goat because I'm going to give you a story that fits in why I'm preaching on the subject of there's a goat in your bed. Watch carefully. There is something called Yom HaKippur, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the sixth moed or the sixth season that Israel is to celebrate each year. They fast the entire day, but it's called better known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would go in first for, the, for himself. They would offer certain type of blood for himself, then for the Levite, then for the Israelite. And if God honored the sacrifices, Israel was forgiven. But there was a process that day that dealt with two identical goats. These two goats had to look exactly alike. Some even teach that they tried to select goats that were twin goats born at the same time. These goats normally came from Jericho. Our, a Jewish man said years ago that they used to offer the sacrifices in the temple, and when they did, they would put a special oil on the sacrifices, and it would cause a fragrance to fill the area. Now, Jericho is probably about, depends on how you go, 18 miles from Jerusalem or so, and the tradition says that the goats would smell the offering when the wind would blow down those mountains and start sneezing. They were allergic not to the burning of the sacrifice. They were allergic to the oil that was on the sacrifice. Oh, Pastor Phillips has already got it. See, you can go to church and not offend nobody as long as there's no oil flowing. As long as there's no anointing, as long as there's no power, as long as there's no excitement, everybody comes and they leave after one hour and they're happy. But when you got some goats in the church, you'll know you got a goat because when the oil starts flowing, they'll be the first one to start sneeze, sneezing and walking around and tell you, I just didn't like the way that service went today. I just think we need to do something about that. Come on now. So here's what happened on the Day of Atonement. Two identical goats came and stood before the high priest. The priest had what's called a lottery, which was a wooden box. On that, in the Hebrew, was written the word, for the Lord and for Azazel. Now, Azazel is interesting because this Azazel seems to be another name for Satan, or it was the name of a fallen angel in Jewish history. And I won't have time to develop that. So the priest would hold, put, it, pray, put his hand in the lottery, and one goat was marked for the Lord, and the other goat, which would be called the scapegoat, goat was marked for Azazel. Now, I want to tell you something that they did to the horns of that goat, which is very, very, very important. All right? Here's what happened. There were three red threads according to uh, the Talmud in Yoma 39b. The three red threads were this. One red thread was put on the horn of the goat, for the, uh, the horn of one goat. Another red thread was put on the neck of another goat, the second goat. And then a third red thread was nailed to the temple door. Now, let me read to you the Talmud Yoma 39b. There was, at that point of time, something happened. One goat that was for the Lord is taken to the altar and sacrificed and burnt on the altar. This goat remained alive, and the priest would lay his hands on the horns. He'd wrap his hands in the shape of the letter sheen around that goat's horn with one hand and the, uh, with the other hand, and he would transfer the sins of all of Israel in a prayer onto this goat. Now listen, this is where this, this, is where this message comes in. They would then have a cable or a cord tied to this goat's neck. This goat would then be led to a priest on the Mount of Olives outside the eastern gate. He would then transfer the cable into the hand or the cord into the hands of another priest who would lead this goat across the ridge toward the going toward the Dead Sea. That priest would be running with that goat. He would then hand it off to another priest who would be stationed. Now, everybody stay with me because I want to read from the Talmud. Here's what it says. The goat was released in the wilderness. Now, this is the scapegoat. This is the goat that had sin placed on it through the prayer of the priest. It is released into the wilderness. Here's what it says. The purpose of the red thread on the right horn. Now, the goat on the altar had a thread around its neck so that when the priest cut its neck, what happened to the red thread? The blood poured over the red thread. Now, they got another 18-inch thread tied, scarlet thread tied to the door of the temple or nailed there, according to some. Watch what happens. The purpose of the red thread was on the right horn was to identify this goat. It would mean that sins were returning to the people. They eventually had to push this goat off of a cliff. But in Jerusalem, they knew when this goat was dead, 
dead in the wilderness because the red thread on the temple door turned white. In the book of Isaiah, this is the verse that they use, Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The Jewish rabbis teach that that verse is there based on the fact that when this goat with the sin on the people was eventually thrown off of that cliff, and one time on a partner's trip, we took jeeps to the Mount of Azazel in the will. I'm telling you, this is in the middle of nowhere, and they showed us the cliff that this goat tumbled down when this goat breathed its last breath, broke its bones, and carried the sins to the wilderness, ladies and gentlemen, the red thread on the temple door supernaturally turned white. Why is that important to understand? Because there was a crucifixion one day that took place on a hill called Calvary. And there was a cross on the left and a cross on the right and a cross in the middle. Now check this out. When you want to go back to the story of the goat, you find out that you've got, a, you've got three things going on, which is three red threads. One red Red thread on the goat for the Lord, one red thread tied to the scapegoat that is released, and it got a red thread on the temple door that changes colors. You got three crosses on the hill. You got one thief, ladies and gentlemen, that died with sin on him. He died. He said, I don't believe, forget it. You got one thief that changed on the cross. He's that red thread on the temple door. Though his sins were as scarlet, they became as white as snow. And you've got one man in the middle dying for the Lord. Talk to me somebody. Now, if you want to go just a little bit deeper with this atonement message, let me tell you something else that went on that you might not be aware of. Are you aware of the fact that there had to be two goats on the day of atonement? One for God, but one that escapes with sin on it. Do you know that there was a man called Barabbas? bar Abbas is his name. Bar is the Greek for son. Abbas means the exalted father or the high father. You got a man named Yeshua. Now, one of the early fathers, I'm not sure which one it was. It may have been Origen. He wrote about what Barabbas' name was. See, Barabbas or Barabbas is like Bar Timaeus. Bar Timaeus means son of Timaeus. It's not his first name. It means son of. But one of the early fathers says that Barabbas' name, you ready for this, was Yeshua. So, if that's so, you've got Yeshua Barabbas, Yeshua, the high exalt, the son of our exalted father on earth, but you've got a Yeshua, Jesus, who is the son of the father in heaven, the highest father. Come on now. You've got one Yeshua who's going to go and die on the altar like one goat had to die on the altar and give up its blood on atonement, but you've got a Barabbas who has sin on him. He hadn't repented, and he escapes, and he's released by Pilate on that day and he leaves with sin on him without being forgiven. I say I wish somebody would help me shout yes in this house and in case you did not know it, listen to me, put it together. I did some research on this. My book on the priesthood of the blood, I talk about it. I want to tell you that you want to know who was supposed to be on that middle cross? Barabbas was. But do you know who the other two men were? The Bible said they were thieves. Do you know what? It was a thievery ring led by Barabbas and those were his two partners. There's some history on that. So Barabbas escapes and his two partners are up there on Golgotha's hill. One dies with sin, but one's changed in the middle of the situation. And Jesus said, you, sir, today shall be with me in paradise. I hope someone hears it. Oh, but let me tell you something. <laughs> Betsy. <laughs> Lord, I just offended everybody by the name of Betsy, didn't I? <laughs> Would you listen to me for a minute? There is a reason that this goat was eventually pushed off a cliff. I did some study on this. Y'all want to know why? Oh, thank you all two of you that's really into this message right now. <laughs> thought I thought it would go over better than that. I haven't got to the heavy part yet, so stay with me. I want you to listen very carefully as I explain to you why that they eventually pushed this goat off a cliff instead of letting the goat roam free. There were, in the tabernacle of Moses, there were mountains in certain parts of Sinai, but depending on where they pitched, there wasn't a lot of cliffs. This goat had a red 
thread on it because the Talmud, I don't know if you understood what I was saying there or not or what they were saying, is they wanted to make sure if that goat had sin on it, so many goats looked alike, that if that goat came back into a town in Israel, that they wouldn't touch it. Yeah. They wouldn't kill it and eat it. They wouldn't take it into their house. They'd say, oh, don't you get near that goat. That's got the red thread on it. It's marked. By the way, Paul said, mark those that cause division among you. Leave them alone. Don't you be hanging around that. They're not right. Stay with me now. The reason they pushed that scapegoat when they put that red thread on it off of a cliff was so that the goat would not return to the house. Because before they start doing that, that goat may have gone to the wilderness for a while, but the Bible says when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from whence I came. Stop. You may not realize that is a Yom Kippur imagery. Y'all just missed it right there. The goat goes, but that goat wants to come back. And Jesus said, if you let him back, you get seven more spirits more wicked than him. Now, here's what's sad, and I'm going to prove this to you. Ready? Some of you are going to bed every night with a goat. Well, I still can't figure out, Brother Perry, where you're going with this message. I just ain't figured this out yet. Let me explain it to you this way. In the Bible, there was what was called the sin offering and there was what was called a trespass offering. There are five major offerings, but there were two. Listen carefully. The sin offering was the sin offering that you brought when you committed a sin against God. When you absolutely broke one of the Ten Commandments, you had to bring a sin offering. There was what was also called a trespass offering. A trespass offering was called an offering of the sin of ignorance. You did something, but you didn't realize it was wrong. How many of you know some people become saved, they're new converts, and they still cuss, but they don't know they're not supposed to, you know. I saw something that happened so funny one time on Christian television. They were having a biker rally, and these two biker, you know, a biker, they call them biker chicks. A biker chick and her boyfriend got saved. And the person was saying, come and testify what God's done. Well, I'll just tell you what, it's just real good. I feel real good now. And, you know, the person was just really just saying, man, this is great. And they said, we just need to rebuke the devil. We just need to cuss the devil, curse the devil, just curse the power of the enemy. Said, I'm going to hand this mic to you. I want you to curse the devil. They did. You blankety blank, blank, blank devil. You blank. Because, because to them... To them, that's what, you know, we, we would say, curse the enemy. I bind you, devil. I rebuke you, devil. But that wasn't curse to them. <laughs> Everybody still here? <laughs> Listen carefully. If a person sins against God in the Old Covenant, they had to bring a certain offering to God as a sin offering. If a person sinned ignorantly, they had to bring a certain offering because it was called the sin of ignorance. But if you trespassed against another person, it's called a trespass offering. Now, Jesus did not say, forgive us our sins as we sin in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I'm not trying to get into translations here, but I think it's interesting because he was saying there, because Jesus had no sin. But he said, for those who are offending me, I release them. For those, God, who trespass against me, I'm not holding it in. I'm releasing it. Now, I'm going to give you one of the most remarkable verses. I'm going to break this down. And that's why I got the goat in the bed. And you're going to understand it in five minutes. Jesus, after his resurrection in John chapter 20, 23, said this, whoever's sins or offenses you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever's sins you retain, they are retained. The New King James say, uh, says, receive you the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, 
That may not make a lot of sense to you, but let me share this with you. Everybody say remit real loud. Say remit. remit. There are three Greek words for remit. The main word found in the New Testament means to dismiss or to release, like forgiving a person, Acts 2, 28. Then there is the remission of sins mentioned in the New Testament that is a word that alludes to passing or removing away a sin debt from someone. Then there is a Greek word, remit, afiami, and I'm not great in Greek, so I probably butchered that. I'm much more <laughs> easier in Hebrew. But it means to send away or to loose. Listen, it means to send away or to loose like the scapegoat. To remit, to remit the sin is to send them out of your house like the priest got the goat out. But if you retain a person's trespasses in your heart, then the goat is in your bed. Now you're going to get it. And every night that you lay your head on a pillow and you do not remit and send forth people's offenses that have hurt you and said bad things about you and made fun of you and mocked you and you don't let it go, every night you go to bed, you're just kissing Billy on the cheek. <laughs> and you're going to bed with the goat. Because that word remit is similar to when the priest would remit the sins by sending the scapegoat into... Is anybody hearing this? When you forgive them, it's released. It's, it's released from you. Well, I just don't know if they forgave me. Guess what? The goat's now in their house. You just sent the scapegoat out of your bedroom. You just sent the scapegoat out of your house, and you sent it to their house. Now, they're going to have to deal with that goat. Oh, preach on. Now, let me tell you how powerful this is. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither shall your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Matthew, did you realize what that just said? <laughs> I, think, I think Billy got it. <laughs> he just fell out and it wasn't in the spirit either. I feel a T.L. Lowry anointing coming on me. I'm going to sling this. Look here. Let me go back to this. Do you realize, look at, the, look at the wording of this. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Folks, that verse indicates that you can sit in a church, you can go home, open up your Bible, watch a little bit of Manifest with Perry Stone before you go to sleep, and still... Ask God to forgive you, but the Bible says you cannot be forgiven till you get the goat out of your bed. That's the book. Put, put these verses together and realize the, the power of forgiveness and the power of holding in something. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive... Neither will your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your trespasses. That's Mark 11, 25 through 26. If you'll check it out, it's also about giving. If a man goes to take his gift to the altar, don't give your gift at the altar till you first be reconciled with your brother. Can I tell you a little secret in my opinion? I'm a fourth-generation minister, and I've preached in many wonderful churches. I'm going to tell you, every church I've preached in, I have liked. I'm not saying all of them were my favorite, but I've, I've enjoyed the people. But can I tell you something that I believe? I believe there's a reason that in some of those traditional churches, they have given offerings for years, but they've never got a breakthrough yet. Because your gift of giving cannot be blessed as long as you have unforgiveness toward that preacher that made you mad that just left six months ago. It's awful quiet in here now. The Bible says 
if I have had a trespass against me and I'm not willing to release it, I will hinder my prayers. The Bible says my prayers can't be heard. I will hinder God's ability to forgive me and release me. That's in the book. And I will even hinder my giving. And no wonder there's so many people who sit around and make a statement like this. Well, I just tell you what, I've been here in church a long time and I've been giving for my tithe for years and I've never seen a breakthrough. That prosperity jump don't work. No, it's not working with you because you got Billy wrapped around your neck. Come on. Come on, you come with it. You, ca you carry him into church. I just tell you one thing. I'm so glad we got rid of that last pastor. He got on my nerves. I didn't like that music. I didn't like the way he was preaching. Well, saints, it's good to have you here today. Woo! Hey, glory to God. How, can, can you feel it? Can you feel it? How, glory. Then it starts drying up in the church, and they have to get somebody up there that knows how to sing, and they've sang that same song for 40 years. And the juice is all gone from it. And they're up there, and they, here they bring, they bring Millie with them, Millie the goat. Now, I'm just using names, so if that's your name and you feel bad about that, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> Must be conviction. <laughs> so she's going to get up there and sing. But the problem with her is she's been bad-mouthing all the new people coming into the church that took her seat and took her parking place and singing those songs that she doesn't like. So she's up there trying to get something going, and she's mad at you because you won't shout while she sings. And she gets up there, some of you are so dead. Some of you used to have the victory. You ain't got the victory. She starts rebuking everybody, but her problem is not the music. Her problem is she got a goat connected to her. Y'all, you may get this at 3 in the morning, but you're going to get it before you leave here. That's the problem, because if we don't release and we don't forgive, then we will have difficulty. Now, to show you how powerful words are, let me give you three scriptures. This is not in my outline. I just wrote this down today, guys. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and what? Death. Do you all really believe that? That's all uh, 300 of you. Let's try that again. Do you all really believe that? Jesus knowing their thoughts. Do you, do you believe that thoughts can transmit in an atmosphere? I can prove to you they can. Have you ever walked into a home and they've been fussing, but you didn't know, but you could sure feel it? Yes. You ever walked into a church where it's tight? It's like, whew, what's going on right here? Whew. They're not saying anything, but their words have created an atmosphere. Do you believe your worship creates an atmosphere? Yes. Do you believe your praying creates an atmosphere? Yes. So what does that tell you about words? That they are creative forces, correct? God said to take the Word of God and write it on the doorpost of your house. Now, would you pray tell me what writing something on a post can do? He didn't say speak it over your post. Write it. There may be a nugget here that writing does things, that even writing words can have an impact. Let's show number four, guys, the rice picture. Y'all will never forget this. Gary Townsend did a rice experiment. And uh, I had a friend of ours that gave me these pictures that knows the person personally and says this, is abso this absolutely is as it happened. It began April the 1st of 2000. It was a batch of organic rice that was cooked and the same amount of rice was measured out from the same pot put into two identical jars with the exact same details in each jar. Everything was exactly the same, put in the same place beside each other, and they sat in the same spot April 1st to June the 22nd, which is 81 days. Now, put up number five, because something happened. The jar on the left after this long period of time, you can see it still maintains a rice appearance. The jar on the right is completely deteriorated and moldy. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Because without speaking, this is what was written, slide three, next slide, on the jars of rice. I love you. I hope you last a long time. You're a nice rice. <laughs> this was written and placed on the outside of the jar and the words facing the rice. On the rice that died was written, 
I hate you. You are bad rice. I hope you die. Now go back to the previous picture because I want people to see it. There, there you, and I didn't point it out because I didn't want to. There you see the writing on out the, the jars. Now I want you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. If in an experiment a person can write something on a piece of paper and rice that has no ears would live or die, what do you think your words do to people? I heard a minister share this, and I had a friend of ours look this up, and he said, there was a report that I did find, he said, that came out of the Solomon Islands where this happens. It's called the tree spirit. And there's a group of people that every year find a tree. And I even believe it may have been Bishop Jakes that reported this at one time as well. And they have difficulty cutting down these large trees, very large trees, so they yell at the spirit that's in the tree. Now, these are people, they're not Christians, but they think there's a spirit that lives in that tree. And all they do is stand around it and yell all day. And they yell for 30 days, and that tree dies. I will not name this man because I've not got his permission to share this publicly, but he's an older man of God that has preached to millions of people in his lifetime. When he went to a university, a Christian university, years ago to speak, a friend of mine drove him around, and it was a great honor. This friend told me this himself. And he said, this man shared something with me I've never forgotten, Perry. He said that his wife in the back of the house had built a, like a greenhouse for plants. She loved flowers. And she's, this man told this young preacher, he said, I'm going to show you the power of words and the power of prayer. My wife said to me, when you are away for weeks at crusades, my flowers don't do well. They start getting limp. They start getting brown spots. She says, when you are here and you get up in the morning and sit in here and you walk this area with your Bible <laughs> and you pray and read, my plants are green, my flowers are blooming, and they're beautiful. And he said, every now and then she'll call my name and she'll say, hey, get in the greenhouse and pray a while. And he says, I'll, I, he wouldn't say it publicly. He said, they'll mock me to scorn if I say it. But there is power in what you say. I can remember growing up years ago and going to wonderful meetings, great conventions, thousands of Christians there. But as a teenage preacher, my spirit would become so grieved. I don't mean angry, grieved. Because over in the corner, there would be seven to eight ministers. And you know what they would be talking about? Not a great revival that broke out. Not a great missionary that had a great story. Not their church where they just had people say. They'd be calling out the names of the three or four television preachers and telling you how they didn't like them. And did you hear what he said the other day? Or they'd be talking about another pastor on the other side of the room. I could not get into the conversation. I cannot count in my lifetime how many times at ministers' meetings I have walked away from a crowd of preachers. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. I didn't want to hear their negative junk spewing out of their mouth. And the problem with some of them was this. The people they didn't like, they were envious of because those individuals were having results and these other men were not having results. Preacher, if you're watching me right now, don't you expect to have results if you have envy like King Saul toward another brother? Because the Bible teaches me that when you have that animosity in your heart, it hinders God's blessing in your life. I'm telling you, if a bunch of pieces of paper on a rice jar can kill rice, what on earth? earth do your words say? No wonder the Bible says by your words are you justified by your words you are condemned. Somebody give God praise in this house quick. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to show you three things that God has put in your body very interesting. Number one is the human eye. 
Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 23. 22, I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 22 through 23. The lamp of the body. The lamp of the body or the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. My wife and I, there's a Christian woman. I don't know if she still lives in Cleveland, but she used to do my hair. And she sat down one time and she said, let me look at your eyes. And she said, wow, you've had a problem with such and such. I said, how did you know that? A physical problem. She said, let me see Pam. And she looked at Pam's eye and she says, well, there it is. You've had back problems. Pam said, I had back surgery when I was 19 years old, but how did you know that? And she showed me a chart and she showed me and I looked at my wife's eyes and she said, God made the human eye. She says, now this is a very ancient method, but why did doctors used to look in your eye with a light? They don't do it like they used to. Everything is done by machinery now. It has to be done uh, on paper. You know, it's got to be professional. It's got to be on paper. It's got to be by computer. Do you know why a doctor looked at your eye? Can anybody tell me? Because on your eye, it's like a clock. And when you have a physical problem, if you have diabetes, if you've had heart trouble, if you've had your eye, there will be a dot that will appear on your eye, and it will be like a clock. And depending on where that dot appears, it actually tells you the part of body, your body that's suffering. And I didn't believe it at first till this lady started doing it with people that I knew, and I'm saying, goodness sakes, she says, God put it there, and she said to this verse, don't you remember reading that if the eye, oh, you'll get this in a minute, if the eye is bad, your whole body's full of darkness. You say, that's talking about something else. Maybe it is, but I'm telling you, that's how your body knows what's going on in your body. I got to have, uh, why did doctors used to say, stick your tongue out, well, to look at your tonsils? Not only that, older doctors know this. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof, Proverbs 18, 21. There is a certain type of coating that comes over your tongue under certain circumstances. And old doctors weren't just looking down your throat. An old doctor that knew how to look at your tongue could tell by the coating on your tongue what was going on in your body. Come on, talk to me. Rabbi, can I borrow you? Would you run up here real quick? I'm not going to do this and put him on the spot, but I will let you do this later because this is the absolute fact. This works. Take your, let's stand right over here. Take your, are you left-handed or right-handed? Take your right hand and hold it out like this, okay? Now, you resist me. Just resist me. I'm going to try to push down, okay? I'm pushing pretty hard, ain't it? Now, if I were to ask the rabbi a question and he were to lie about it, he cannot resist me. I'm, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. He's... He's a Jewish rabbi, and I'm going to ask him if he loves Israel. And I want, this may not work with him because he's got so much love in him, it may not work. But I'm going to say, do you love Israel? And you say, no, I don't. And you hold your hand out and see what happens. And, and we've not planned this. I'm telling you, you can do this with your kids. I'm going to show you something. Hold your arm out. This may not work with you. Do you love Israel? No. You hate them? Yes. When he does not tell the truth... It weakens his arms. You can, you can look at your kid and say, were you out tonight with somebody? No. Hold your arm out. <laughs> no, no. This is the honest truth. This, I'm telling you, I've just given you the greatest revelation of this whole message. This is the truth. I have had doctors, chiropractors and doctors explain to me how this works, and they said, it is really true. If, if they are telling the truth, you say, resist me, you, you cannot, if they're strong, you just start pushing. But I'm telling you, if they have told a lie, their arm will go as limp. You don't even have to try. I, could, I have done it with people before, look here, and taken one finger and done that and just took their arm right down. Why spend all the money on lie detector tests? Come on, talk to me now, somebody. I just saved the government some more money if they listen to what I'm trying to preach in this world. I'm telling you, it's an actual physical lie detector test. If they lie, they cannot resist. It weakens. Woo! Now, you imagine, you imagine, again, let's go back to words. Imagine that when you get angry, 
cancer doctors in Mexico have proven you shut your immune system down six hours. When you become angry, your immune system. So what about someone who lives in anger? No wonder sickness upon sickness upon sickness. Doctors will tell you who are Christians that one of the biggest things that keeps people from being cured is unforgiveness. That 80% of the people lying in a hospital bed, now some of them you know have the body begins to wear out and certain things begin to happen that, that's hereditary. I'm not including that. But I had a man who was a doctor that said, I, Perry, I think there's 8 out of 10 people who come to visit me that if they could get unforgiveness, bitterness, and anger out of their spirit in a relationship with God, they would not even have to be in a hospital. They would not have to take antidepressant medicine if they could simply get that out of their spirit. I'm trying to preach tonight and tell some of you, why don't you get the goat out of your life? Why don't you send him out of your house? Why don't you get him out of your bed? I'm almost done, but give me a few minutes because there's something else I feel like I need to share with you. I was preaching several years ago in a church, and I'll not name the state or the place because a lot of our programs go on manifest, and I wouldn't want to have anyone there feel an offense at me telling this, but it's a, it's a wild story. I'm preaching this church, the revival went three weeks. There was a man sitting on the front row, and so helped me when I would come in and out that door. He'd meet me at that door, and he'd start quoting scriptures. Brother Bird, you know Psalms 551, John Bird, Isaiah chapter 3, 4. I'm thinking, boy, this guy's a scholar. He must be the godliest man in the church. Here we go back again to what it is outwardly versus what it is inwardly. So he comes up to me and wants prayer about this. I think it was like the second week of the revival. He said, Brother Perry, I'm going deaf, both ears, and I want God to heal me. I said, why are you going deaf? They said, doctor don't know. I've been checked by all of them. I said, I'm going deaf. There's not a reason for it. Put my hand in his ear, and the Lord spoke to me and said, get your hands out of that man's ear. And I knew, I was under an anointing, so I knew it was God. I said, Lord, why? This is a, this is a mm, patriarch of the church. The Lord said, he's offended my spirit. And I said, God, what has he done? And the Lord revealed it to me. The Lord said, I didn't even know this, but the Lord said, they had a change in a music pastor in this church, and he started singing songs this man didn't like. And this man has said terrible things about the music in this church. Critical, critical, critical. And he complained about the music so much, I'm letting him go deaf so he don't have to listen to it. So, you know, I'm bold. I mean, nowadays I take a little bit more tact. Brother, let me ask you a question. I believe the Lord has told me this. Back then it was, God just told me some. And I just looked at the guy and laid into him. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. And the Spirit of God came on me like an Ananias and Sapphire anointing. You understand when Peter looked at him? And brother, I started rebuke. I said, don't you lie to the Holy Ghost. I said, I'm under the anointing. I know what I'm talking about. I know nothing about you. But I said, you're never going to get healed till you apologize to this church for your attitude. And he stormed out of there. Well, I'm thinking, now I'm in trouble with the pastor, no doubt. So when I got uh, back with the pastor, I said, Pastor, if I've done something wrong, I'll get up and apologize. Maybe I missed God. I don't believe I did. And I told him what I told the man. He said, you said what? I said, I'm in trouble. I thought to myself, I'm in trouble. He said, Brother Perry, I have not said nothing. I have not said nothing to you. I have not said nothing to you. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, I didn't say nothing, did I? I, didn't. I said, nothing about what? He said, about that man. I said, no, I don't know. I've seen the guy. I don't know nothing about the man. He said, let me tell you what happened. We had a music pastor change in this church, had a new pastor come in, and he wasn't singing all the songs from the hymnal, and that guy got mad. Here's what he did, Perry. He stuck cotton in his ear three inches thick and had it hanging out of his ear, would stand up and turn and face the congregation with the cotton like this. He said the Holy Ghost just nailed him. And I said, well, Pastor, I'm glad you confirmed that because I'm going to tell you something. That man left mad, and God's never going to heal him till he repents to this church. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That's pride when you won't repent after God nails you like that. When the Holy Spirit reveals something and you don't repent, it's pure pride. Now, I'm going to tell you, if I'm going deaf and somebody tells me that's the problem, I'm going to say, where's the mic? I'm serious. Give me a mic. <laughs> Got to get up here repent. I'm going to be careful telling this story, too, because uh, of the sensitivity of the people that are involved. But years ago, my father was pastoring in a, a neighboring state, and there was a meeting, church meeting that went on, and while he was conducting the meeting, a woman jumped up and screamed. He didn't know who it was. He thought it was a speaker, maybe a truck driver going by that said, come out of him, you devil. That the, what was that? 
So he kept on, and he hears it again. Come out of him, you devil. He looks, and there's a woman standing up in the meeting on a Sunday afternoon, pointing her finger at my dad, saying, come out, you devil. And my dad, you know, dad calls everybody sister. He calls my wife sister. He never calls anybody by their name. Well, sister, he even looks at me. He says, now, brother? I said, Perry. <laughs> Perry, Jr. Now, brother? He's always done that, hadn't he? We tease at the office. Brother Fred, well, brother? And he says, well, sister, now, what are you, what are you doing? She says, I don't, I believe you're lying. You got a devil in you. And my dad's left hand, and his left hand starts shaking. He starts speaking in tongues, and the woman ran out. Now, listen to this as I'm telling it as it happened. The next morning, she got up and couldn't speak. Well, she thought it was a fluke till the next day she couldn't speak. Then she thought that was a fluke till the next week she still wasn't speaking. She goes to a doctor. The doctor said, we don't know why you can't talk. I mean, she couldn't even carry on a conversation with her children. She could not speak. Nothing came out. And this went on for weeks. So do you think she came and repented? No. Listen to what happened. It was going to cost her thousands of dollars to go to another state just for them to examine her and find out what happened. And I was preaching a revival at my dad's church. My dad told me nothing about that. He didn't even mention it. Neither did my mother. And I'm getting ready to preach, and I see my dad call a lady out. It happened to be this lady, and called my mother up, and I'm up here preaching, and dad's talking to them and praying. He prays for this lady. She goes and sits down. I think nothing of it. And here's what happened. When my dad was in that service, the Holy Spirit spoke to my dad and said, now, bro, and it says, called him Fred or called him son, said, son, that woman who said that about you has got too much pride and she is never going to repent. But her children are crying at night because mama can't talk to them. And I'm going to heal that woman if you will release her. You just release her. You, ha you have to pray for her for it to happen. But you release her. I'll heal her not because she deserves it, but for her kid's sake. And he called her out and said, he didn't say you're never going to forgive, but he said what the Lord said about the kids. And do you know, 6.30 the next morning, the woman got up and could speak perfectly. Here's the part that's strange. She told people for years, I wish I could uh, forgive Brother Stone, but I have too much pride. Well, their house burnt down once, almost killed them. Then their house burnt down twice and almost killed them. And a few years ago, they tell, told me going 70 miles an hour, she had a car wreck and died, ki got killed in a car accident. Because I believe the woman was turned over to something that she had no control over because of unforgiveness. Now, I'm in the Bible when I tell you that, by the way. Now, the point is, and don't miss the point, you can damage your walk with God your life and your family by holding on to things that God wants you to let go of and God wants you to release. Four things you do. Some of you have heard me tell this. Number one, you got to trace it. Find out what your root problem is. Number two, you got to face it. Quit blaming everybody else for your trouble. Just take your own responsibility and say, I was the nut that did it. Sorry about that. Number three, Erase it. How do you erase it? By repenting, by saying, I'm sorry, by turning. And number four, you've got to replace it. You replace it by doing the right thing in place of the wrong thing. Several years ago, I'll conclude with this. I was preaching in um, getting ready, I should say, for the Dalton camp meeting, which was this camp meeting when it was, was once in the Dalton Convention Center. And the Lord had dealt with me, Pastor, would you stand up from the Pulaski Church because I want him to verify this. Pastor Jerry Collins knows everything I'm saying to be the absolute truth. It was the seasons of Teshuvah. Those of you that have heard me teach that knows what, you know what that is. It's the season on the Jewish calendar where the 29 days of Elul, they blow the shofar, but they reflect on repenting, making their heart right, going to people they have offended, making sure there's nothing because they know the days of all are coming and the day of atonement, God seals decisions for 12 months. I happen to believe that. I really do. And I was saying, God, it's the seasons of Teshuvah. Is there anything in my life that I need to get out? And the Lord reminded me of an incident that had happened 25 years ago. Now, in this incident, it was a total misunderstanding. There was never a conflict face to face, but it was a terrible, terrible misunderstanding that led to some heartache and grief on my part and the part of a pastor and his wife. That pastor had died a few years after the incident. Now, I did go to him, 
but he wasn't very receptive at the time. And God said, you are to write a letter to this pastor's wife. You are to tell her the details of how you tried to do the right thing, but you were blocked from doing it by church leadership. You are to tell her the inside story of the satanic group that worked its way into the church through a man in the church. And I, God showed me everything to tell her. My problem was I didn't know where she was. I hadn't seen the woman in 20-some years. I'm at a bookstore the next day, and a couple that was the best man in my wedding walks up to me, and I had not seen him in so long. I can't even tell you how many years it is. And all of a sudden, I said, is Sister So-and-So still, so -and -so still living? I know she's from your state in Virginia. Oh, yes, yeah, she's still living. She's our member. You're kidding me. No, she goes to our church. said she almost died a few weeks ago. And God sent me, this is the pastor's wife talking to her, and said, you're not supposed to die yet. There's some unfinished business. I said, you didn't tell her that. Yes. And said, so she got better. I said, I'm the unfinished business. And God, I spent about five hours on about a four-page letter. The pastor was about four pages or so, wasn't it, if I recall. And I, you know what I did? I took full responsibility. I said I was an immature preacher. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I tried to do the right thing. They blocked me from doing it. I told the entire story. And I mailed it. I think I gave it to Gina. I said, Gina, get this to this address overnight. I want the woman to get it. God spoke to the pastor because the incident happened at the church. He was not pastor then at the time, of course, and spoke to him to take a board member to see her at the same time God spoke to me and asked her to forgive the church for the attitude some of them had toward the husband. So here she gets my letter and a visit from the pastor of the church 20-some years later. Come here, pastor, real quick. Tell me, <laughs> I wish I could tell you everything. <laughs> Come here, Jerry. You went to the house, I never got to see her. But tell me about the letter when you guys walked in. I don't want to give her name, but tell, tell kind of what happened. When we came in, um, I just felt like God had led me to go to her and, and ask her to forgive the church because of some horrible things that took place. And a lot of it involved Perry. When we walked in, I told her, I said, sis, this is the reason I've come. And it was me and a board member and the pastor that Perry was referring to. And she, she said, I just got a, a letter from Perry. She said it was so sweet. She said, he's a nice guy. And, and you could just see that break off of her. And she said, you don't know what that letter has meant to me. And we had prayer with her. And I got down and asked her to pray with me. And when she prayed with me, when we got ready to leave, she said, will you tell Perry that I love him? And I want to tell you just a little side note to this. I don't know if Perry was getting ready to allude to this, but at that moment, there was not only a spiritual, but a financial breakthrough, both in our church ministry that is still lasting to this day, as well as one of the greatest breakthroughs in, in his ministry. And it was just so powerful. And I'll never forget, Aunt B got me and Perry together years ago, nearly eight years ago at Pigeon Forge. I, I'd heard about Perry. In fact, a lot I'd heard about him wasn't so good from some ministers that were jealous of him when I came up. And I have forgiven and sent that goat out, by the way. But I'll never forget the first words. I, I spoke to this man sitting in rocking chairs at the Apple Barn. I said, Perry, if God has brought me to Pulaski, Virginia, for no other reason, it's to help restore what was lost when you first came here. And I'll never forget, he broke down crying, and he said, I made plans never to come back to that area. And he's been back seven years in a row since, and God has just done some great things. And we have overflow crowds, three or four hundred in an overflow room, can't get them in the building. And God was, God, what I'm telling you is God restored everything. The attitude of the lady. And see, it was a situation, Pastor will tell you, that I didn't necessarily have to do that. But God said, if you want my blessing, you have to do it. Hang on a minute. Hang on, brother. Let me finish this just a minute. Hang on. Let me tell you what happened. I want to tell you the end of this story because this is very, very important you understand what happened at the end of this story. 
I got the greatest financial breakthrough in the history of the ministry. I'm talking about, do you remember, Pastor, it was that week when I sent the letter. Now, you got to remember, the 29 days of Elul go by. There's 10 days of awe. In the days of awe, we were at our Dalton camp meeting. I don't mind telling you this. We received the largest financial gift, unexpected, of $240,000 that on, on the Day of Atonement, on the day when the judgment is sealed, on the day when the goats, <laughs> come on now, you'll get it in a minute, are, are taken out and when the goats are removed. Are you looking? Look this way. Listen to me, folks. It's important you hear this. I don't want you to be distracted because you've got to hear the end of this. You cannot maintain a blessing with God in your life if you allow a situation that has happened to you years ago to be maintained in your spirit. It will corrupt your spirit. It'll stop your financial blessing. It'll stop the flow that God wants to bring in your life. And you've got to, you say, well, I don't feel like forgiven. Do you think I do? I bet there's been times I don't feel like forgiving either. But you've got to make a choice to release pastors. Okay, we're going to do this right now. We're not going to wait. For, we're going to wait. Not going to, we're not going to wait 30 seconds. I want everybody, you've heard, my, you've heard this word. If you need in your spirit to let something go, get out here right now. There's somebody, there's something, there is a church, there is a situation, there is a person, there is an ex-husband, there is an ex-wife, there is a business associate, there is an ex-boss that fired you. There's somebody that you've got to get out of your spirit. Come on and do it. Hurry. Hurry. The anointing of God is here right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless his name, bless his name, bless his name, bless his name.